Okay, so let's take a look at minerals today and let's see what, what we can learn about them. So the first thing we want to look at here is we want to actually look at the definition of a mineral. So a mineral is pretty long, I mean this definition is pretty long. So let's take a look at it. So a mineral is a naturally occurring inorganic solid with a specific chemical composition and a definite crystalline structure. Phew, that's a lot. So what do we mean by all that? Well, let's take a look at this and go into a little bit more detail here. So let's take it bit by bit and see what it means. So here's the first part. Naturally occurring. Okay, so what does it mean to be naturally occurring? It means that the mineral was formed by natural processes. It means it wasn't formed by man, so it wasn't like a, um, maybe like a diamond or something that's man-made. This is something that's made by the earth. And the other thing is, is that it's inorganic. So naturally occurring inorganic, which means that it was never alive, and it was never alive any part of it of its existence. Now some of those definitions are changing. But as for this, for right now, we're going to keep with this definition here, that it was, it was never alive and any part of its existing. So number one, the first part tells us that it was naturally occurring, and the second part is that it, uh, it's inorganic. The second part on this is, is that it's a solid with specific compositions. So minerals are not liquids, they're not gases, but they are solids, and they have to have a definite shape and volume. Okay, so some are cube shaped, some are rectangular, some are uh, like a dodecahedron type shape. And we have all different types of shapes here. And each type of mineral has a chemical composition that's unique to it. So I'll show you here in just a second, like salt. Salt definitely has a, a, a specific comp, a chemical composition. Now, some minerals are... Uh, compounds so they have multiple elements to them like salt does it has sodium and has chlorine or chloride in it but however though when we look at copper so copper like this here just has the copper mineral in it or element in there it has nothing else gold sulfur can be the same way silver and that's all you find However, there are some minerals that are compounds, and then there are some that are just composed of a single element. Okay, but most of them are compounds here. So let's take a look at this. So this is a salt crystal. You look at the salt crystal, it has this nice cube shape to it, and it will always have that cube shape. In fact, if you see right up here, you can see that there's a little square, and it keeps making these cube shapes. Interesting thing about it is if we were to break it, and it, it would keep breaking in those cube shapes. So it has this repeating pattern, which you'll find out a little bit more. It also has a specific chemical composition to it, so it sodium chloride, okay, and some elements like or some minerals like this copper this natural copper um, this is the crystal of copper and it is just copper on its own so we can get them to where it's just one single element or it can actually be a compound all right now hopefully you know what a mineral is okay so it is inorganic it is um, naturally made and it can be made up of compounds it's a solid and it has a definite crystalline structure to it, it has a shape to it um, and it can be made well and it has a definite chemical composition and it can either be a compound or a single element okay and there's a lot of things out there that actually qualify to be a mineral for example like water and so may not sound right but under the definition, if it's like ice and it's found out in the lake or even a snowflake that is made naturally, technically, by definition, it is a mineral. And that seems kind of weird, but not really. If you really stop to think about it, it's just something that we normally don't, wouldn't think of it as a mineral. So where do minerals come from? Well, let's take a look. So one place we can get a mineral is from magma. So a magma comes from deep in the earth. That cooling magma, it comes on up and it can turn into a solid and we can get all kinds of minerals from that. Okay, 
One little note here is this section right here. Um, you're actually going to want, so right here, the one thing about it is that minerals can either have large crystals or small crystals in them. It just totally depends on how fast and how or how slow that they cooled. So if we can see here, crystals that cooled really, really fast and really rapidly end up having little teeny tiny crystals in them. But ones that actually cool really slow, the crystals can grow and they can get large. And that's two things that we can actually identify. And usually the ones that are really small are lava, so it's formed outside of the earth. And the ones that are large, if it's from magma, are inside of the earth, like granites. Okay, so we can get minerals that are from magma. Another place we can get minerals is from solutions. Now this may, this hopefully will make some sense. When I look at these two here, they're both really saying the same thing, it's just about how you look at it. So as you can see, like I have in this vial up here, I have a solution. And that solution, if it becomes super saturated with something in there, say like I put water and I put salt in there, okay? So if I put water and I keep adding more and more and more salt, then when there becomes more salt than what the water can hold, well then the salt that dissolved in there will start precipitating out. And that's when we have a super saturated solution and we add just one little bit more piece of maybe like salt to it and the salt will actually start falling out and we'll get it precipitates like what you see in this tube up here. The other way is the same thing, but instead of adding more salt or some uh, substance to it, we take away the liquid. So in this case, if I had a cup of water with salt in it and it wasn't saturated, if I evaporate the water out, then it's going to get to a point where the ratio of salt to water is going to change. And as soon as that water becomes less than the substance that's in there, then it becomes super saturated again and then we start precipitating out minerals or crystals. So anytime that we have super saturation where you can have the formation of minerals. Great Salt Lake does that. Um, it, it's super saturated with salt and so we get a lot of crystallization of salt there. So we can get it from solutions. Okay, So we have those two types of minerals that we can get either from the earth or magmas or we can get it from solutions. Okay, now if you look here, we have about 30 minerals that are common in the Earth's crust. Okay, and out of those minerals, there's only, there's about eight common elements. Okay, so what are those common elements? Well, we have oxygen, silicon. These are probably your two most common elements that you will find in almost all, uh, it's like 97% of all the, or 93 uh, percent of all the Earth's crusts are made up of these two, oxygen, oxygen and silicon, which makes a lot of sense because that's just basically anything that has a glassy look to it, uh, like quartz, all the beach sands, all the sand dunes. Um, I know down in southern Utah you get down into the, the sandstones. Um, that's just all quartz, and so we have lots and lots and lots of it. Amazingly enough, aluminum is uh, another common element. However, you're probably not going to find aluminum by itself. It's going to be in a matrix of something else. Iron, then we have calcium, sodium, potassium, and magnesium. So these eight elements are the most common. The two that you probably need to know that make up most of everything else is going to be the oxygen and the silicon. All right, let's move on from here. Now, here are your um, the oxygen silicon type minerals, and we call them silicates. See, so, yeah, I was pretty close. 96%, not 97. 93, it's 96%. Okay, so we can actually categorize minerals into two categories. Okay, either they're going to be silicates or they're going to be non silicates. And any silicate is something that's going to look really glassy, like this quartz that I have right up here. It has a kind of a glassy look. Okay, Silicates all contain silicon and oxygen in them. And oftentimes they'll have some other kind of trace element in there, which oftentimes just changes the color. 
Okay, so the majority of all the earth is made up of these silicates. And the, one of the reason is that we see so many silicates on our planet is simply because of the way that um, the molecule of the silica or that the silicate looks like. So it looks like a pyramid. And if you can picture, we have a pyramid here and we have three corners down that sits flat on the bottom. A pyramid, a real pyramid has four. So we're just going to have just three points on the bottom and one on the top. Each one of those on the outside points is an oxygen atom. And then the very center of that pyramid or that, that triangle is a, a silicon uh, atom. And they all connect. Now, because of this shape and because of what it is, it easily likes to combine with other molecules. And so it tends to be attracted or other things attracted to it. And so we have a lot of silicates, which 96% you know, of all the minerals on the earth tend to have silicates in them. Okay, what are the other ones? Okay, so we have silicates and then we have non-silicates. So all the glassy stuff are going to be the silicates, which means all non-silicates are probably not glassy or they're typical, typically metals. Okay, so this means that the mineral structure has a metal forming element in its matrix. Um, they may act like a metal. They can have a metallic look to them, which you'll see here in a little bit when we start going over minerals and how to identify them. But definitely, it, they're minerals. So we look at two things, non-silicates and silicates, either glassy or metal. Those are the two types of categories that we look when we look at minerals. OK, so how do we identify a mineral? So you're out, you're, you're a geologist, or even if you're just out walking around on the hills and you're looking down the ground and you see something really cool. How in the world do we actually know what the mineral is? Because there are hundreds of minerals out there. So there's some real simple tests that we can actually do to make this very, very, very simple. So a lot of the tests that we do are just based off of the physical and chemical properties of the actual mineral. Okay, and there is not just one test. We have to use a combination of tests here in order for us to be able to identify that mineral. Um, there's just no one true way. It takes multiple, and you're going to see here why. Now, some are better than others, and some are worse than others, but let's take a look and see, okay? So, some of the things that we do when we are actually looking at minerals, this is probably the very first thing that you notice. In fact, it's probably one of the, one of the main reasons why you even picked up a rock to even begin with is because of its color. It's usually the first thing that's noticed. Um, it's usually caused by some presence of another element that's in there that may uh, say like maybe I have some copper in uh, some quartz and maybe it will turn it more blue or possibly green. Um, I think magnesium tends to turn things kind of a purplish color. Okay, so we have some kind of trace element in there that's in the matrix that causes it to have some color. However, though, color is the least reliable uh, simply because so many different minerals can be the same color. Okay, so one thing when a geologist, I, 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 like for me, I can pick up a mineral and sometimes the color I can identify it right away. But oftentimes I'm not just looking at the color, I'm also looking at the shape and luster of it as well. So I'm actually combining a bunch of tests all at once. But typically, if you're around something all the time, you can kind of get an idea of what it's going to be by the color. But if it's something that you've never seen before, this may actually be something really hard. So take a look at this, okay? All of these that I'm going to show you are actually quartz minerals, okay? But take one look. If you didn't know any better, you might actually say, oh, um, maybe that's not quartz. And here's another thing is sometimes when we get quartz minerals, and if they've been polished or cut and I can't see all the markers on them, it's super hard to be able to identify what it is because it really could be about anything. But you can see here, how many color variations do we have here? Well, we have red, green, we've got some pink, clear, we've got some purple here, or we've got some blues and different variations of blues. We've got black and we also have 
brown. Okay, lots of different colors, all kinds of colors. You may even think that this green one over here is an, maybe emerald. If you didn't know any better, you might think that it's emerald. Um, you may think that this red one right here is ruby, but it's not. They're all quartz. So color is a really bad way to go, unless you know your mineral really well. But if you ever have a polished mineral or anything like that, or some rock that's been polished, and you take it into a geologist and have them look at it and say, what is it? More than likely, they're probably going to say they don't know. Um, yeah, and it just totally depends on what it is. But more than likely, they're going to say, I don't know what it is. OK, let's take a look at this next one here. So luster. Luster is the way that a mineral reflects its light. And everything reflects light differently. Think about it. If you have something here and the light is coming down and it bounces and into, goes into your eyes, that surface is going to reflect that light differently. Okay? It may be if it has a really dull surface, then it might actually look dull. If it is shiny like glass, then it will have a glassy look to it. If it's more metallic looking, then it may actually look more metallic. Okay, so a luster is the way that a mineral actually reflects its light off of the surface. And there are a lot of different ways that it looks. So as you can see here, um, some may look glassy, some may look oily, some may look greasy, waxy, Absolutely, I've seen a lot of waxy uh, minerals out there. Metallic for sure, dull and pearly. So let's go through this and take a look at some of the, these things here. So, okay, these are minerals that are metallic in look. So we have pyrite, we have magnetite, and we have galena. Take a look at them as I spin them around here. They tend to have a real metallic-y look to them. They tend to have a real metallic -y look to them. They look metal. Okay, another one that we look at here is glassy. This is a glassy luster. So I have halite right here and I have obsidian right here. When that light bounces off of them, they tend to have this really shiny glassy look to them. Okay, this is what we would call a glassy luster. Let's take a look at another one here. These are a little bit different. So this is what we'd call a pearly luster. Now this is selenite. And I've put a pearl here. And take a look. When this is going around, look at how the light bounces off of it versus the pearl. They have seem very similar in the way that they reflect that light. So this is what we'd call a pearly luster. Okay, the next one here that I have is going to be more of a waxy luster. Now, I happen to have a couple of minerals here. This is calcite, and I actually put a piece of wax on the top of this so that you could do a little comparison. It's a little hard because of the, the filming here versus actually seeing it, but it tends to actually kind of have that waxy look. Okay, and then definitely this is what we'd call a dull luster. So what we have here is a piece of hematite, and you may even call this earthy. Um, it's really dull. It just it looks like rust. It doesn't have any reflection to it at all. It tends to absorb a lot more light, and so you don't see any real sparkliness to them. Okay, so these are some of the looks that we would actually look at and see, um, and part types of the luster that we have here. Now texture. Texture is another way that we actually look at a mineral and how it actually um, may feel to us to the touch. Now, believe it or not, some of these may seem like obvious. Oh, okay, it has a smooth. Like if I had something that's glassy, it may have a really smooth feel like glass does. Or rough, like that last one, that um, hematite. It has a real rough look. But some actually feel greasy when you touch them. It feels like you've got grease on you. Um, some clays will feel that way. Um, soapy or waxy. Um, talc can often feel soapy. Um, and, it, and it may even feel waxy at times too. And it can even feel silky. So different minerals can feel different ways. And so texture is usually one of those ones. One that we, I use texture a lot with is with talc because it tends to have this very silky, soapy feeling to it. Okay, so let's go to streak. 
Now, streak is a powdered form of the mineral. So what we end up doing is we take the mineral and we scratch it onto a, um, a ceramic plate. And oftentimes the color doesn't always look like we think it should. So I have the streak plate here and you'll notice that it's a piece of ceramic. I take a piece of calcite, which is yellow in color, and I take it and I scratch it across the top of that streak plate. A streak plate is harder than the calcite and so the calcite actually will rub off onto that streak plate. Now it's hard to see what color that streak is because it's white. White on a white uh, piece of uh, uh, the street plate is white, the piece of ceramic. But I dumped it down onto that paper and you can actually see. Now I take a piece of pyrite here, which is gold, yellow color, and you would expect it to be that color, but it's not. It's actually a dark charcoal looking color. Um, it looks totally different than the actual mineral. This and the last one here I take is a piece of uh, magnetite. And magnetite, you would think that it would be dark, but it's actually not, it's brown. So when we look at it, it is a different color than its actual mineral, than the solid portion of it. So the powdered version often looks different than the solid, the actual mineral. And this is one way we can identify a mineral because of its streak. It looks way different than maybe it normally does. Okay. So the next thing we want to look at is hardness. How hard is this mineral here? Okay, so Hardness actually measures how easily a mineral can be scratched. So as you saw, I took that calcite and scratched across the top of that uh, ceramic plate, and I did the same thing with the others. Well, a, a German geologist by Frederick Mose, and there's a picture of him down here in the corner, Okay, he developed a way or a scale to be able to identify the hardness of minerals. So he took 10 of the most common minerals that were out here that are just everywhere, and he just started scratching them and tried to determine whether or not which one was harder than the other one. And so he actually took it, scratched it, moved it over, and he identified them by their hardnesses. And this is what we call the Mohs hardness scale. So let's take a look at this. Mohs hardness scale takes these 10 minerals and identifies them by their hardness. Talc being the softest, and then we have gypsum, calcite, fluorite, apatite, feldspar, quartz, topaz, and corundum. And then, of course, the hardest one is diamond. Okay, I'm actually going to show you all of these here. We're going to take some time and actually show you how this works. I've made a little video about this. But the one thing that I want you to, to understand is that there's a lot of hardnesses out there. Talc is considered one. Gypsum is two. Calcite is three. However, you could have a 2.5 like fingernail right here. Your fingernail has a hardness of about a 2.5, which means that since gypsum here is a two, your fingernail is actually harder than gypsum. So you could take gypsum and scratch across your fingernail, and it won't, the gypsum won't actually scratch your fingernail, but your fingernail will scratch the gypsum. Okay, copper penny has a hardness of 3.5, iron nail has a hardness of about 4.5, glass 5.5, steel file 6.5. Now you might wonder what's the difference between an iron nail and a steel file. A steel file or even a pocket knife can be about the same. Um, a pocket knife or a steel file is designed to be, it's hardened, and so it, you can actually file other metal. You could file down the iron nail to this as well. Um, iron is a little bit softer, the iron nail is a little bit softer versus the steel uh, file. The streak plate that you saw here earlier, that white ceramic plate, has a hardness of a 7. And then the only other things I have here that are common, these are common things by the way, not just I mean, I, I could get other things in here, and the reason why I ha why we have all these things on here is because these are things that you might have on your person. So we're looking at it from a geologist's perspective. If a geologist was out in the field and picked up a mineral, there's probably <laughs> probably a good chance he's got fingernails. So if he knows his fingernails or a she, they know their fingernails are a 2.5, well, then they can make some variations of some tests based off of that. More than likely, you can either find or you might have a penny in your pocket.
and an iron nail granted you may not have one but I'll bet you can find um, something that's similar to it and a piece of glass I've done labs in my class and not had a enough glass to actually test and been out went out to parking lots and just grabbed a little piece of glass and brought it in and they were to do that so glass is also something that's easy um, and then of course a steel file if you have a pocket knife um, maybe even some keys that are a bit harder um, that's going to vary on there but definitely a pocket knife you might have on you I and mean, you can actually test out the hardness by doing that as well so these are common things that we have around that we can actually test so let's take a look at this and let me show you this video here so what I have here is I have all of the the uh, the nine or the ten uh, minerals that we would use the only one I don't have is diamond of course um, and I really don't need it because nothing's going to be harder than that. So what I have is a piece of talc here. And that talc is pretty soft. I scratch it across my fingernail and you can see it doesn't leave a mark. However, my fingernail will scratch it. This is a piece of gypsum. So I scratch it across my fingernail here and my fingernail is a hardness of a 2.5 and gypsum is a hardness of a 2. So this should not scratch my, my thumbnail there. Okay, but my thumbnail will scratch it. And if I take the gypsum, scratch it onto the talc, the gypsum should be harder than the talc. And sure enough it is, that talc was scratched and the uh, gypsum was not. So my next one here is calcite. Okay, so calcite is strong enough to scratch my nail. It has a hardness of a 3 and my nail has a hardness of a 2.5. So you can see it definitely left a mark on my fingernail. Okay, it is hard. Um, a lot harder than other things. Now the copper penny, um, it has a hardness of a 3.5 and calcite has a hardness of a, of a 3. So this really shouldn't leave a mark on there. It may have scuffed some of the old stuff off but if you actually look at it there's no gouge in there. Um, there's some polishing of maybe some buildup of other things that are on the penny but the actual copper doesn't get scratched. Now what I have here is a piece of fluorite and a piece of calcite and fluorite is definitely harder than calcite and you can see that it scratches the calcite, it definitely leaves a, a groove in the calcite and uh, one thing that you want to do when you do this is you definitely want to see which one is scratching the other one. So I put this calcite onto the fluorite and you notice there's no groove into the calcite and when I pull the stuff off uh, wipe it off with my hand, it's actually the calcite. So fluorite, it's pretty hard, but an iron nail has a hardness of about a 4.5 and the fluorite has a hardness of a 4. So the nail should scratch that fluorite as long as it is a good piece. Sometimes when we grab these minerals they're not all fluorite or they're all calcite they have other minerals in there so you've got to be careful of what you're scratching now you notice the fluorite doesn't scratch the glass the glass has a hardness of a 5.5 so it means that the glass will actually scratch the fluorite but it won't scratch um, uh, the fluorite won't scratch the glass now this is a piece of appetite appetite is pretty tough we, it's about a 5 and uh, the glass the glass is a, well, the nail here, you already know it's a, it's a 4.5, appetite is a 5, so uh, appetite should scratch that nail. And you'll see that I scratch it on the side. That is a lot better way to do it than to scratch it at the point. So that way you can actually see the scratches um, and to see how well it goes. Now this piece of appetite, it's not super great because it has a whole bunch of different minerals in it as well. So you want to make sure that you've got all the pieces in here, that you're finding the right stuff. Now the glass. Remember the glass has a hardness of a 5 or 5.5 and the appetite has a hardness of a 5 and look what happens. It won't scratch the glass. The glass is actually harder and that little powder that you saw there is actually the appetite being scratched by the glass. Okay, So glass can be pretty hard. Now we get up here to number six on our list and that's feldspar. Feldspar is actually really hard. It is a six so it 
We can take that nail and scratch that feldspar all day long and it won't do anything. But it, it will do something to the nail. You can see there's a little bit of a gouge right in there. Um, it's hard. It can cut. And the glass, for sure, it should scratch it because it is a... The glass is a 5.5 .5 and the feldspar is a 6 and you'll see that we get a nice scratch in that glass. That is not... That is all glass. In fact, when I run my fingernail in there, I can actually feel the groove that's been cut in there. Interesting thing about this is when we look at all this stuff, this is how sandpaper works. We take minerals, mostly corundum, and corundum is the very last one here. Or sometimes we even, yeah, and corundum is, yeah. We can take um, quartz, we can take different types of minerals on there, and we can break it up into little tiny chunks and put it on some sticky paper and glue it on, and it will, all sanding does is just scratches things down. So yeah, we can sand glass, we can sand metal, we can sand wood. We just have to put something on there that's harder than it. Okay, another interesting thing is, is if you mow your lawn a lot, now grass has a lot of silicate in there, which is basically glass. Glass has a hardness of that 5.5, .5 and your um, metal blade probably isn't as hard as a, a steel file. So it's probably a little bit softer. So why do you need to actually sharpen your mower blades if you're just cutting grass? Well, because the silica that's in the grass is actually harder than, than the metal itself, and it will wear down that blade. Now, what you're seeing here is I have a piece of topaz, which is the lighter color, and the darker one is corundum. Corundum is basically a ruby or a sapphire. Um, this isn't a gem quality corundum. Uh, a lot of times you'll see this crack, cracked and spread all over uh, sandpaper. That's what usually sandpaper is. It has a lot of corundum in there, depending on the type of sandpaper. But corundum is very hard. Uh, the only thing that's harder than corundum is a diamond. So that corundum will scratch everything on there, everything you see. Um, however, though, it will not scratch a diamond. But the diamond itself will scratch all of those, and it will scratch the corundum. So this is what the most hardened scale is. It takes all ten of these, okay, starting here from um, talc all the way down to corundum right there, and they're in order from 1 to 10. And this one we have 1 to 9 because we're missing diamond. And everything is in order as far as how hard it is. And of course we have things that are in between. Okay, so let's move on and take a look at some other things that have to do with minerals. So when we identify minerals, we know that we look at color, we look at the luster, we look at the texture, how does it feel, we look at the streak color because it's different, the powder form is different than the actual mineral itself, and of course I just showed you the hardness. And another thing we look at is a thing called cleavage and fracture. Okay, so minerals have a cleavage or a fracture. And what that means is how does it actually break? If you were to hit it, how does it break? Now cleavage means that if you actually look at the mineral itself, like do you remember the very first uh, cube of halite that I showed you and it had little tiny squares that you could kind of see in there? Well, if I hit it on one of those points, it will break on that cleavage plane. That cleavage is a plane where the mineral will break naturally, and it usually always follows the um, crystalline structure of it. So that little salt crystal or the big salt crystal of the cube, if I was to take it and break it on its cleavage plane, it would continually break on little, they would make little cubes. Go take your salt shaker put some salt in your hand and take a good look at it and you will see that they're little tiny cubes and if you were to break them they'd even be little tiny cubes. Now it doesn't mean that you can't grind down the corners or anything so it's not going to be perfect but if you do it right on the cleavage plane they'll always make little tiny cubes. Now a fracture is a little bit different. This glass up here that I have, that, that green glass, you see how jagged and edged it is? Okay, this means that when I break that mineral, it's going to break like that. There is no actual um, pattern that's going to follow. Um, Indians did this. They loved minerals that were like this, especially if like obsidian or chert. 
um, they could actually take that and do that napping. Napping is where you take it and you break off little pieces of that rock and it will make a very, very sharp edge on there for like arrowheads or other stones that are cutting. Um, that is what um, a lot of Indians use when they would make their tools or their weapons. They would take rocks or minerals that would break along fractures and they would actually do um, break that rock into make a sharp tool or knife. So this is one of the things that we look at. Does it cleave? Does it fracture? What is it going to do? Now, there are some minerals out there that definitely have special properties to them. And these are something else that we want to look at are what are some of these special properties. So some of these properties are that they just have dead giveaways. If I'm testing them, like if I was doing a lab, these I would test these first before anything else just to identify exactly what it is. So like calcite, calcite always fizzes. If I put hydrochloric acid on it, it will fizz. Alka-Seltzer does the same thing. So if you were to put take an Alka-Seltzer and put a little bit of vinegar on there, it would actually fizz, which is why it works when it gets into your stomach. Um, or like Tums will do the same thing. So when you put Tums uh, and you swallow it, your stomach's full of hydrochloric acid and it will neutralize the acid that's in there. Magnetite, okay, magnetite is an iron ore, ore so, and some iron ores are naturally magnetic, so I can take a magnet and put on them. And then there are some minerals out there like sulfur. You can smell a long, long ways away. It smells like rotten eggs. Um, you go up maybe to some hot springs or other places like that and you can smell the sulfur from a long distance. So let me show you some of these. Uh, I also made another little video here to hopefully help you to be able to see some things here. So let's take a look. I have some hydrochloric acid and I have a piece of calcite here. So I'm going to go ahead and put some hydrochloric acid onto the calcite and you'll see what this acid will do to the mineral. You see that it fizzes and uh, we get a nice bubbling action going on where that acid and the calcite are neutralizing each other. That is a dead giveaway. I would definitely put acid on things um, if I was in a lab and trying to identify a mineral. The other thing I would do is I'd take a magnet and I would see if the magnet sticks to the mineral. If it does, you know you've got magnetite. Okay, It sticks. Um, you'll see it, it's a little hard to pull off. Um, you can even take little tiny staples and put on the magnetite and the staples will stick. Now just to show you, I bring out this piece of pyrite here and the pyrite, even though it may look like metal and maybe it should, it doesn't have any magnetic properties to it. So it doesn't stick to there. Okay. So that's one of the special little giveaways is, ah, okay, Does, is it magnetic? Does, if I put acid on there, will it fizz? And then of course smell can be a part of that as well. Okay, gems. Okay, I am not a big person on gems, so just know that this isn't me. Um, I tend to like the minerals and their natural beauty, okay, the way that they look. Um, gems are really hard to identify. As you can see, we have all these gems here, but really, you, you, any, these all could be those quartz gems. Um, you got red and green, and so all those colors. Gems are valuable minerals, okay, and they're usually identified by how um, popular they are or by how rare they are or how pretty they are. Um, not so much the sparkle in there because that sparkle comes from the actual cut. So the more facets we can put on a gem, the more light we can get into it, and the more light we can get into it, then the more sparkly it becomes, okay. Usually sizing and clarity of the mineral give us the value of that gem and um, the weight of the gem, which is also measured in carats, um, give us the value of the gem. In my own opinion about this, um, I think, and I really believe this is not really opinion, it's just the way it is, but um, gems are valued for their actual popularity. Um, not for actually what they are. For example, like this purple here, that could be a piece of amethyst, which is just quartz. And this one right here, this yellow one, that could be citrine, and that could be that's probably quartz as well. Um, 
but maybe people like purple more than they do yellow. And so, because purple's more popular, it costs more. Um, I've seen where things fluctuate up and down. Another thing to know also that diamonds are not really that rare. There are lots of diamonds, it's just that they are controlled. So a lot of uh, diamonds are not out, out, out into the public, only so many per year, which keeps their value up. All right, I hope that this helps you out. I hope that this helps you to be able to understand a little bit more about minerals. Um, what can I tell you? Have fun. Go out and take a look at some minerals. When you're out looking at some rocks, take a look at them. Um, some minerals will even fluoresce under black lights, uh, like fluorite will. Um, have some fun with it. Go out and look at some rocks. You probably even have some rocks that are in your drawer, or that special stash of pretty rocks. Take a look at them and see if you could identify what some of those minerals are. Maybe try some of these tests out and see for yourself. Anyway, I hope this helps and uh, enjoy the world of minerals and rocks. Take care.